She's the author of Body, Mind, Spirit, Soul, Oneness, Dominance Theory, A Guide to Elevating Your Five Dimensions of Self. And having stepped away from her teacher career, Margot recently earned her doctorate degree from the University of Oxford, Doctorate of Philosophy. Her thesis developed an action plan for implementing the concept of spirituality into Alberta public schools, which is very, very important at this time because there's so many people coming into and growing up that are spirit soul dominant and they're living within the dominance of the mind and sometimes they don't know how to fit in well her work is all dedicated to that and so I want to well we're honored to have her here today let's welcome Dr. Margot McKinnon Well, thank you, everyone. Is this is the mic loud enough and everybody can hear me? Wonderful. Well, first of all, I felt very warmly received here. Just walking in and people introducing themselves to me, I felt really at home here. So thank you so much. And thank you, Margaret, for introducing me to Reverend Bruce. Uh, I was speaking in Calgary and Margaret was there visiting her sisters and she heard me speak and she said, you need to connect up with Reverend Bruce. So we did. And that's how I ended up here today um, from Calgary. So I want to talk to you today about my book. Um, this is actually the second edition. I wrote one about 12 years ago. And this is the revised edition that I put out in May of 2018 this year. Um, and you know what? It was the uh, product of a homework assignment while I was doing my master's degree at the University of Calgary. And the homework assignment, I was actually doing teacher professional growth plans in organizational culture. Does that sound academic-y? Um, so I took this one class for myself and it was called Philosophy of Mind. And uh, the homework assignment was, how are the body, mind, spirit related? And I thought, well, I've been, I've been on that mission to understand that my whole life. I'm 58 now to understand that my whole life. And I've done a lot of things in my life to try and work that out. I'm particularly interested in what is the spirit dimension of self. Um, and so to find that out, I was one of those little kids who used to see spirits. And uh, I would hear a voice telling me, and I remember my very first voice I heard, uh, I was putting my little doll Michael to bed and pulling up his little blanket at four years old, putting him to bed, and I heard this voice that said, you are to be a teacher. That's how it sounded. And a little four-year-old, okay, sure, I will. And I did. And I had other opportunities as I grew older to do other things that would actually make me way more money. But I didn't because I, at four years old, I had made this promise to whatever that voice was. And I found out over the course of my lifetime, when I listened to that voice, everything worked out. <laughs> and when I didn't, things went awry. <laughs> so when you have an experience, and I'm pretty sure many of you, and some of you came in and told me your experiences this morning when I was sitting back there at the front door. Um, many of you have had them, and, you're, and some of you have really understood them well, and some of you are still on a mission trying to understand what are those voices and what is your spirit. Uh, so I had that. I used to see spirits. I could see into the future, and I could have these visions about people and tell them this and that, right? So I had that, and I always wanted to know what it was. So I did things like um, I went off when I was 25 years old, and I taught in China for a year, and I went to Thailand, and I sit and sat with hill tribe people. Uh, sitting in bamboo huts in the, with a candle burning with elders telling me what their idea of the spirit is. I did like a pilgrimage in Tibet before that was ever cool with the Tibetans back when I was 25 years old. Um, sat with indigenous people in sweat lodges and Sundance ceremony listening about the spirit. 
Um, going by my own experiences, sitting on a hilltop, no food or water by myself, going, when I'm starving on day three, what happens to the body? What does the mind do when it's stressed? What's the spirit do? So when the, my professor said, um, figure out how the body, mind, spirit are related, that's something I'd worked on. So I went home and I went into a vision. I made the space to create, to have this vision, and I went up and I said, universe, tell me, what is the answer to this question? Now, I wasn't really expecting an answer. I thought it was going to get like a glimpse. I got this full-on theory, came pouring down. I had to grab my yellow pad of paper. I was writing it all out like this. And that's what I want to share with you. And I wrote it, my first book, I wrote it all out. But over time, my readers have said, oh, could you put in a conversation guide? Oh, sure, because they were using it for a book club. Oh, could you put in uh, the self-inventory so we can start measuring how we're doing in our body and in our mind? Oh, sure. So I've added all that in. Plus, I've added in, a, I've developed the oneness concept more. But I'm going to tell you what the message was that I got. Um, so I know you can't see this in the back row, but I think you can. Anyway, so I, it's talking about the original question was, how are the body, mind, spirit related? I got, well, we actually have five dimensions of self, not just three. We have a body, mind, spirit, soul, oneness. First question I asked the universe, oh, really? Spirit, soul? I thought they were the same thing. No, they're different. Two different dimensions of self. Okay, what's the difference? The spirit is the real you, it's your intangible you, it's the part of you that when you pass over to the other side, it's going to go back over. My big question is, so what's my spirit doing right now while I'm alive? That's what I want to know. And I also want to make sure I've created the life that my spirit wants to live here. Now, I had further understanding of spirit because prior to this vision for this book, I'd had a near-death experience. Has anyone had a near-death experience? Okay, so this story will probably resonate with you. Um, so I, my spirit came, my mom had passed two years prior. My spirit came out and it went to the most beautiful, unconditional love I've ever seen. It was so bright white like this. My mom's face came down and my mom had this smile that went like this and when she came, like we always thought of her as these big white smiley face and she came down, I could just see this white smile coming down. She came down like this and I was going up and I was like <gasps> and it was fused right inside me, this absolute most beautiful unconditional love and I'm not, I did this, I have to take my glasses off as if you can see me in the back row again, but I, I said, well, open your eyes bigger so that you can see it. I don't know how I thought my pupils were gonna get bigger, but anyway, open your eyes bigger so you can see this unconditional love. And then I even got it in my head, open your mouth bigger and then your eyes will be bigger. I don't know how that works, but anyway, I was like this, going up, right? And uh, so I had my mouth really wide open and so to get my eyes bigger so I could see how beautiful it was. And anyway, my mom said, you can't come any farther. You have to go back down. And then my spirit went back into my body. And when I came to, like I was lying on the ground. I used to be standing. <laughs> and I was lying on the ground. And then... I looked around and I wasn't quite back to being human yet. And I looked at my hands, okay, where am I? Okay, who am I? And then somebody standing by me said, Margo, oh yeah, that's me. I'm Margo, I'm Margo McKinnon, the teacher. And then I remembered who I was. So anybody who had that an experience similar, we can talk after. Um, and so, but when I came back, 
um, I thought, you know what? The unconditional love I saw was so beautiful. Why is it so harsh and abrasive down here? Like life seemed harder. Life seemed harsher. when it, I hadn't really noticed it before, but I noticed it once I experienced this unconditional love. And so I decided that I was going to create, I was going to recreate that unconditional love here on earth. I was going to try my very, very best to make as much of that unconditional love that I saw my whole life. And I wasn't going to have any meanness in my world, unkindness in my world. I was going to be unconditional love for myself and for everyone else. And I was a high school teacher. My classrooms were all about that unconditional love for all those kids and they knew it right always like this is a space when you walk in the door you will feel completely loved here and that became my life um so i've always that so the spirit that was my spirit part that went over there and it was my spirit part that came back okay my soul is my purpose so if we go back to the beginning, my body is this. My mind is my logical, rational self. It does my tax returns. <laughs> it budgets. It got me to the airport this morning on the right time and finding, you're in row 19 at parking jet. Okay. That was my mind got me there. My spirit is my real self. It's the part of me connected to absolute unconditional love. It's the part of me that wants to create unconditional love here. My soul is my purpose. You are to be a teacher. I'm a teacher. Oneness is your sense of connection and belonging to all time, space, people, everything, all energy. So we're having a oneness connection right now. I felt incredible oneness when I walked in here, actually, because people were so warm. People made me feel at home here. So oneness is the part of you that is at home with all. You're even at home if you're late for something. You're even at home with, you know, driving on, in rush hour traffic. I'm just at home. So that's your oneness. It's also if you're in the Rocky Mountains and you're looking out and you feel that incredible awe and wonder at just being alive. You're at one with your experience. So, that's, so we have these five dimensions and we can draw on them whenever we want. So I draw on my mind to do my tax returns, for example. I love that we have five fingers. Well, five. Five fingers, it reminds me, body, mind, spirit, soul, oneness. Have you attended your five dimensions of self today? Um, but my, the voice told me much more than that. It said you're born dominant in one of those dimensions. And you grow the other ones over time. So a body dominant person. The spirit came in, loves being human. Loves hair, makeup, nails, food, wine, beautiful table, beautiful soaps by the sink. All those tangible, sensual things. Love it. Mind dominant, logical, rational. They'll organize everybody. Systems. I'll, I'll take charge of this. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're doing that. And they tend to be the boss or the manager at work because they're wonderful, very gifted at organizing large groups of people into their systems. Sometimes, it, think of them on spectrums. So a mind-dominant person who hasn't developed their spirit, soul, and oneness, they might be kind of rigid about their systems, thinking that everybody's supposed to fit into them. School, and I was a school teacher, as Bruce said, so um, I say schools are mind-dominant systems, and mind-dominant kids get to be successful in those systems because they're geared for their skill sets, math, science, you know, 
history, even history is taught in a mind dominant way. Um, so it's a mind dominant organization. The mind dominant kids get to be successful. They get to go on to university. They get to go on to be the bosses. Okay. Spirit dominant. They value unconditional love, peacefulness, a conflict free lifestyle. So spirit dominant people um, tend to find this world harsh and abrasive. They can feel like a stranger here on earth. They might feel like they're more like a ghost than they are a human being. And you know, as a little kid, I used to lie on, because I'm a spirit dominant person, I used to lie on my bed and I'd go, and I would talk to the universe and I'd say, how long do I have to stay here? Like, I'd be like five. How long do I have to be here? You are to be a teacher. Okay. Um, then I'd say, I'd be lying on my bed going, like, do I have to do this, like, all day? Breathing. Yes, you have to breathe. Well, this is a lot of work lugging. The, and look at the huge body I got to top it off. I didn't get a nice, sprightly body. Anyway, I have to lug it around. And I always felt like I was lugging around this body all day long. And, uh, and then eating. <laughs> I'd like take two lettuce leaves off and just eat them like that. Sometimes I'd have to say to myself, like, have you eaten today? <gasps> yes, because in my spirit imaginary world, I had. <laughs> Is there any evidence in your kitchen that you ate today? Anything in the garbage? <laughs> Anything missing out of your fridge? Oh, I guess I haven't. But that's why fasting was really easy for me. Other people, oh no, we can't eat for four days. I'm going, woohoo. <laughs> I don't have to cook or anything. Four days. I get to live in my natural state, not eating. Um, so spirit dominant people, uh, they value unconditional love, but they can feel lonely for that unconditional love if they don't know how to create it here so they can be lonely here and they can pine to go home now and they want to go home that's remember i said to how long do i have to stay here and as a high school teacher i could see day one those body dominant kids rocking into class matchy purse the shoes the hair the nails and they've got all their friends you need a seating plan for them because they know everybody the mind dominant kids okay do you have a seating plan where do i sit and where how many marks am i getting like just show me how many do i have to make how much do i have to do here is this being marked no then why are we doing it I mean, we'd be having class discussion. Is this being marked? No. Well, I'll come back when we're doing something we're getting marked in. Um, the spirit dominant kids would come in like ghosts and go and sit somewhere off to the side, glide in, sometimes under a hoodie. You know those kids, right? The earbuds in going in, they don't speak to you. And when I figured out this model, I learned how to connect with them. Because so, they feel lonely here and some of them will go down the pathway of drugs and alcohol. And when you think about alcohol, spirits, right? <coughs> Wine and spirits. So it, it makes you feel like your spirit's in when you drink alcohol. It soothes you, it brings you the, back to that place of unconditional love and peacefulness. So drugs and alcohol, some of them would be cut, if their sleeve rolled up, there'd be cut marks here. And some of them were disappearing right be before me. So I do presentations for teachers all over Canada now, uh, talking about invisible kids. And I say to teachers, when you see the light going out of a child's eyes, please help them. Don't ignore them. <laughs> Have them come and sit with you at lunch. They're not going to approach you. They already feel like a ghost. They don't know how to connect. So please, just go to them. Pull your chair over and just ever so quietly. They're sensitive, porous kids. It's just so sensitively. Go and pull your chair over and chat with them. 
and ask them, you know, how, you know they're not okay. How are you going to get in there and help them? Because some of them are quietly thinking of going home now. So you really have to watch for your students' eyes and how, how light. If you're, their spirit's really in, they're bright and shiny and sparkly. If they're dead, their spirit's gone. So spirit, those are spirit dominant. We're going to dive into that this afternoon for anybody who's staying after for a workshop. We're going to dive into all these dimensions. You have a self-inventory. You're going to be measuring. We're going to dive in there and get more of this, and then you can start engaging and sharing with your own stories. Soul-dominant kids, people, they know they have a purpose. That's all they want to do. Uh, I'm to be a teacher. I don't want to do anything else. People used to say, Marco, if you couldn't be a teacher, what else could you be? I can't be anything else. That's all I'm going to do, and that's it. But, you know, some of them are showing up in those Dragon's Den, <laughs> Shark Tank, you know that story, where they go with that show on TV where they go in with their big invention, and then the mind-dominant dragons trying to, well, just show me the numbers. You know, but this is their heart and soul, whatever that is that they've invented. So soul-dominant people, they could be working in uh, alcohol addictions, working with people because they want to help people. So soul-dominant people. Some of them will drop out of school because if it's not serving their purpose, they'll go and self-educate and go and do it themselves. Now, oneness-dominant. When I first came up with this model 12 years ago, I wasn't really clear on oneness. And since writing that book and coming up with my next book, I am getting more understanding of oneness, of what it is. And it's the people who really are trying to build connection with everybody, a sense of belonging. Okay? So that's oneness dominant. So when I talk about all of these different uh, types of people, so what is it useful for this model? I put in my book, a body dominant person, when you're healthy, what you look like, strong, you know how to set a beautiful table, you make delicious food, body dominant. But if you're swinging over here to the stressed out body dominant, you might be thinking as you grow older that you need a boob job, liposuction. Are these wrinkles, Botox? And you can see some of our actors and their, you know, their face is just hardly recognizable now because they're so petrified of growing older. Mind dominant, when they are stressed out because they, they are need to control everything and get everything into systems, um, they can um, start micromanaging. And micromanaging at work, and if they're micromanaging a spirit dominant person who feels that unconditional love is where it's at, there can be real, the spirit dominant can just start disappearing. <laughs> and start crying. And the mind dominant might start going after them even more, if you've ever experienced a person like that. And the, the mind dominant might actually think everybody else is an idiot. Look at all the idiots on the road today. I work with a bunch of idiots. What are you, an idiot? I was driving with my friend, and she's a mind dominant. And uh, she said, she was driving me somewhere, and she said, Look at that idiot over there on the road. Another idiot. Oh, another idiot. And I'm sitting there quiet. And she turned to me and she said, I bet you think I'm stressed. <laughs> kind of do. <laughs> kind of. But it's a sign, right? People are not idiots. <laughs> There's something you're stressed and just rein it in. Uh, spirit dominant. You see, I've kind of presented being a spirit-dominant person as not a very nice, very pleasant thing to be. Um, and it's kind of not if you don't understand how to be a flourishing spirit-dominant. So I was a non-flourishing spirit-dominant for many years. And I had a eureka moment. My body-dominant sister took me to Stowe, Vermont. And we were borrowing her friend's house. And my sister, um, she had almond bark and a cup of a pot of tea, and she laid on the couch, and she had this afghan up around her face like this. She was lying there, ah, totally at home, right? 
And I'm sitting on a chair. If I had one here, I'd show you. But I'm sitting, I'm perched. I'm sitting like this, barely touching it, wondering, how can she have somebody else's blanket around her face? How, in someone else's house and drinking out of someone else's cup. And then it said, dawned on me, I get the difference. Because here we are, same mom and dad. She is at home everywhere, and I am at home nowhere. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is it. And that was that day that I, and combined with my near-death experience and this unconditional love, I thought, you know what? I am going to find the exquisiteness of my own life. And I don't do enough body things for myself. Like two lettuce leaves and calling it dinner. So I really learned how to cook. And YouTube and Google really helps. Hmm? That was not an invention. So, uh, you know, so I decided I'm going to learn how to cook. I'm going to have beautiful dinner parties. And we had a basket, and she filled it with all the things you need to have in a house. Which, because I didn't know, you needed a soap container with a plunger that was glass with a nice top on it, and you put soap in there. I thought you had a little cracked bar of soap in a plastic dish <laughs> that you got at Chopper's. Well, so she's really, like, elevated my... And I teach that in my workshops, and I loved it. I turned on my phone as I arrived here today, and there are some of my readers texting me their morning brunches, pictures of it. Made waffles for my family this morning, working on my body dimension of self. Right on. Texting them back from the plane as I'm going towards our loading dock. You know, so they're learning too. Like, I used to think it was frivolous. But with my model, what's nice is you can say, well, how body do you want to be? My family loves, like, their body dominant. So they think that um, a family trip snowshoeing and t having a race up a hill is a vacation. <laughs> I take it you guys don't, or... <laughs> You're not joining? So they're all, no, and you have like bands on your arm, like it's competition. And I'll say, I'll just go run by the river, la, 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 and I'll meet you in the hot tub. So do you see, you just say, how body do I want to be? How mind do I want to be? Well, I got my PhD. I feel that's pretty good. So now, but that's not the end of it. I still want to develop my mind, but I don't want to get rigid. You know, spirit, that's something I work on all the time. My soul, I want to keep growing that. My purpose, because your purpose will change as you get older. If you retire, you'll get a new one. You know, if a partner passes over to the other side and now you're here by yourself, you get another one. You know, so your purpose keeps growing and changing. There's always one there for you to step into. Oneness is one I'm really working on. And you're all helping me because you're really wonderful examples of oneness. And I love Unity Church because that's what it's all about. So we're going to do, I'm going to do a workshop this aft, starting at 1 o'clock. We're really going to dive into all these dimensions. And, uh, and you're going to get a figuring out where you are and where you are on the spectrum. And then looking at the people in your life and how you can respond to them better how you can elevate your life, and if you're spirit dominant, how to really become more empowered and stand in your own power as a spirit dominant person. Because I had another vision, I'm gonna end here. I had a vision when I went to Scotland. I, I was told by the voice, go to Scotland, we have a message to tell you. Okay, so I did, like, you know, I flew off there and I was lying on this rocky ledge overlooking the ocean. I was lying there and I said, okay, I'm ready for my vision. And it said, what do you remember? McKinnon, right? Scottish. What do you remember? I remember, and I'm thinking like genetically, what do I remember? I remember the wind. 
What else do you remember? The grass, the wind and the grass. Oh yes, your spirit loves to be in a place with wind and the grass. That's why your spirit loves Calgary. Oh, okay. And then nothing. I said, well, I spent a lot of money here. <laughs> Is there more? Then it said, yeah, I said, why did you give me this theory, dominance theory, at this point in time in history? And it said, because some body dominants who are not fully evolved around all are too materialistic. The mind dominance that are not evolved are creating structures that people don't want to live in anymore. That's why we're getting so much anxiety and depression and suicide because the structures are so tight now that it's sucking the joy out of life. That, um, and the spirit dominance who understand what unconditional love is and know how to bring it here, they need to develop the leadership skills to rise to the top. So stop shying away from leadership, but step into their power and start going for leadership, and then we'll see a big change in our world. So anybody who's spirit dominant, I hope you're coming this afternoon. And if you want to know more about it, I hope you're coming. But we really want to bring more unconditional love, more oneness here. And we are the leaders of that. That's why you're here today. Thank you.